The US government talks a lot about a so-called rules-based international order. Now, the reason Washington does that so much is because the US is trying to rewrite the international law-based order because the United States is the world's leading violator of international law. There is no debate about that. It is not up for debate. The reality is, objectively speaking, no other country on earth violates international law more than Washington, more than the United States. That's why the U.S. government is trying to replace it with this concept of this very vague concept of the rules based order in which Washington makes the rules and orders everyone around. There is no clearer example of this, of the U.S. being a rogue state than the vote every single year in the United Nations General Assembly in which almost every single country on earth votes to condemn the illegal six decade long U.S. blockade of Cuba. This is a suffocating illegal blockade that has starved Cuba of hundreds of billions of dollars that has tangibly led to deaths and civilian suffering and hunger in Cuba. This is a form of economic warfare, economic terrorism that the United States has carried out against Cuba for over 60 years. And every single year at the United Nations, almost every single country on earth votes to condemn this illegal blockade. This year, 2022, is no exception. On November 3rd, 185 countries at the United Nations, out of the 193 member states, voted to, to condemn the illegal U.S. blockade of Cuba. Only two countries voted to defend this illegal blockade. The United States itself and apartheid Israel which is an extension of U.S. imperialism. It's a Western colonial outpost in West Asia, an extremely geostrategic region with important natural resources and hydrocarbons. This table showing all of the countries in the world voting is absolutely incredible. It shows that the United States and its colonial extension, Israel, are the world's leading rogue regimes. No other country on earth comes even close to violating international law as much as they do. 185 out of the 193 nations, that means 96% of the countries on earth voted to condemn this illegal U.S. blockade of Cuba. Now, there were two abstentions. Brazil, which is currently governed by the far-right Jair Bolsonaro administration, although that's going to be ending very soon, as on Janu in, in January, we see that the new president-elect, Lula da Silva, the former left-wing president, is going to come back. So that means that there's going to be probably one abstention after, and that's the NATO proxy regime in Ukraine. I want to repeat that. 185 countries voted against the illegal U.S. blockade of Cuba. Two countries voted to support the blockade, the U.S. and Israel, and just two countries abstained. Ukraine and Brazil. So that says a lot about one, why NATO has turned, why it's fighting so hard to keep Ukraine into this puppet regime, which Ukraine has been since 2014, when the US government backed a violent coup that overthrew Ukraine's democratic elected government and installed a pro-Western puppet regime. And that's also why the US installed Bolsonaro, the fascist leader of Brazil, after two US backed coups, one in 2016, a political coup that removed the left-wing Workers' Party government and President Dilma Rousseff, and 2018, a U.S.-backed coup in which Lula da Silva was imprisoned on fake bogus charges that have been completely expunged, and that was, that was what prevented Lula from participating in the election he was going to win, according to all the polls, and that's what handed power to Bolsonaro. Now, this, this vote is not new at all. This has been going on for 30 years. Every single year for 30 years, almost every country on earth votes against the illegal U.S. blockade of Cuba. Even the U.S.'s allies, it's, it's basically its puppets in Europe who, I mean, maybe they have a little sovereignty because they're at least willing to vote against the U.S. at the U.N. in this case. So even if you look at the, the EU member states, even if you look at the special relationship between the U.S. and Britain, even Britain, 
votes to condemn the illegal U.S. blockade. Even Canada. Here is the United Nations news report from 2021 in June when it's titled UN General Assembly calls for U.S. to end Cuba embargo for 29th consecutive year. And the vote was almost exactly the same. It was 184 voting to oppose the U.S. blockade, two to support the blockade, and three abstentions. The only difference last year was Colombia. And now Colombia has its first ever left-wing president, Gustavo Petro, and he voted against the U.S. blockade. Whereas in the past, Colombia had been dominated by right-wing U.S. puppet regimes that voted to support the U.S. blockade. For people who are more interested, I actually just did a report, a video and a podcast talking about the historic trip that Colombia's new left-wing president, Petro, took to Venezuela. But the point is that this is not new at all. This has been going on for decades. And the U.S. blockade of Cuba itself goes back at least until 1962 on paper. That is when the U.S. government officially declared the embargo of Cuba. But in reality, the U.S. began imposing illegal unilateral sanctions and starting this economic war on Cuba right after the victory of the Cuban Revolution in 1959, after the Cuban people overthrew a U.S.-backed puppet, a brutal right-wing dictator, Fulgencio Batista, who was propped up by the U.S. as he murdered his people, as he tortured leftists, as he stole billions of dollars through corruption and worked with mafias and the CIA. His, his brutal dictatorship was propped up by the U.S., and it was overthrown in a popular revolution in 1959. And the U.S. empire has been, has been punishing brutally the people of Cuba ever since. Now, why has the U.S. government been imposing this illegal blockade for over 60 years? Well, if you go to the U.S. government's own Office of the Historian from the State Department, you can find a memo that was written by the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Inter-American Affairs in 1960, and it, ex it exposes the U.S. goal with the blockade and the sanctions is to make the Cuban people so suffer so much to punish them collectively so much that they overthrow their government. The U.S. said it, its explicit goal with the blockade is to bring about hunger, desperation, and overthrow of government. This is the document from the official U.S. government website. And it admits in 1960 that the majority of Cubans supported Castro, Fidel Castro. There was no effective political opposition. And, and they also say that the only foreseeable means of alienating internal support is through disenchantment and dis disaffection based on economic dissatisfaction and hardship. So the U.S. government admitted the majority of the Cuban people supported the socialist revolutionary government in Cuba. They supported Castro. And the, the, the only way the U.S. could destabilize the government is by creating disenchantment disaffection, economic dissatisfaction, and hardship. That is to make the Cuban people suffer, to make them bleed. That has been the U.S. goal for over 60 years. The U.S. government wrote, every possible means should be undertaken promptly to weaken the economic life of Cuba. That's the U.S. goal, to weaken the economic life of Cuba. Every possible means, including terrorism, including war. And they say that, th that the U.S. government must do everything it can to make the greatest inroads in denying money and supplies to Cuba, to decrease monetary and real wages, to bring about hunger, desperation, and overthrow of government. I repeat, this is the official document, the memo from the U.S. State Department, admitting the U.S. goal is terrorism. It's to make the Cuban people suffer, to deny them money and supplies, to deny them medicine, to deny them food, to decrease their wages, to bring about hunger, desperation, and overthrow of government. So this explains the U.S. goal behind the illegal blockade that has gone on since the 1960s, and that every single country on earth basically opposes.
Now, I want to answer briefly a question that several people have asked me because it's confusing to people. If you look at the UN General Assembly vote against the US blockade, you see, again, 185 in favor, two against, two abstentions. And you see that four countries didn't vote. Liberia, Moldova, Somalia, and surprisingly, Venezuela. People were asking me, wait a second, why didn't Venezuela vote to condemn the US blockade? Well, I've spoken to Venezuelan experts. I had a conversation with them, with a few people today, um, journalists and diplomatic experts. And they explained that, of course, they would have voted in a heartbeat. In fact, Venezuela was encouraging people around the world to vote for this resolution condemning the US blockade. Why couldn't, why didn't they vote? Because Venezuela couldn't vote. And why couldn't it vote? Because of the US blockade against Venezuela. That is the extreme irony. And it shows the horrible criminality of the US rogue regime. Venezuela was not able to vote against the illegal US blockade of Cuba because it, it itself is under a US blockade and another, another illegal criminal US blockade that has killed thousands of Venezuelans. Now, in order to explain this, we should look at a media report. This is a Spanish language article in a French media outlet, a French state propaganda outlet called RFI. And it's in Spanish, it's from uh, January of this year. So I'm just gonna briefly translate some of the main points. It says Venezuela is among the eight countries that lose the right to vote at the UN because of a lack of payment. It notes that countries including Venezuela, Iran, and Sudan lost the right to vote at the UN because of excessive debt with the organization. Now, what unifies Venezuela, Iran, and Sudan? All three of these countries are under brutal blockades, uh, sanctions by the US economic warfare that locks them out of the U.S. dominated international financial system. And the United Nations itself is extremely biased against these countries. It's, I mean, it's one of the only international organizations where these countries actually do have a voice and representation, but it's also biased in favor of U.S. imperialism in the West. As an example, of course, the U.N. is physically based in New York's, in New York City, in the United States itself, and the U.S. government constantly violates the host agreement that it signed. And it, the U.S. is supposed to provide diplomats and representatives from governments of all 193 member states. The U.S. is supposed to give them the right visas to enter to, to speak at the United Nations. And the U.S. routinely denies them to countries like Venezuela and Iran and Russia. So, I mean, the U.S. violates international law on a, a, on a daily, hourly, minute basis. But anyway, the point is that another example of this bias is that these countries, in order to pay their dues, their member dues to the United Nations, they have to pay millions of dollars, that is US dollars. And because countries like Venezuela and Iran are locked out of the US controlled international financial system, it's very difficult for them to do payments in foreign currencies, especially like US dollars or even euros. So Venezuela owes the United Nations $40 million, that is US dollars. Venezuela can't pay in its domestic currency, the Bolivar. It can't pay in oil, right? It can only pay in US dollars or these foreign currencies that it doesn't have the, the ability to get access to because of the illegal US blockade. So what that means is that the United Nations took away temporarily, it suspended Venezuela's right to vote because it's suffering under the U.S. blockade, which shows once again how the U.S. is a criminal, murderous, rogue regime, and no other country on earth comes even close to being as much of a rogue regime as a, an international global dictatorship as the U.S. It's, it's just unfathomable. Now, I'm going to end this episode here just spending a few minutes looking at the specific UN General Assembly resolution that was voted on, and it's, it's called A-76-405. The links to every source that I mention in this analysis is included in an article that I wrote at multipolarista.com, and I have that in the description below. So you can find links to everything that I've mentioned here. But this 
document, this UN resolution is 177 pages long, 177 pages. Now, why is that? This document, the actual resolution is very short, but this document includes over 170 pages of countries and international institutions explaining why the U.S. needs to end its illegal blockade of Cuba. And you can see here, I'm not going to go through the countries because it's over 100 pages. I mean, I'm not going to spend that much time, but these are written statements from multiple governments that, that were sent to the United Nations explaining why they support the resolution and why the United States needs to end its illegal blockade of Cuba from countries like Albania, Algeria, Angola, Argentina, Armenia, even Australia, Azerbaijan, Bahrain, Bangladesh, Belarus, Belize. I mean, there's so many. Bolivia, uh, Botswana, Burundi, Cameroon, even Canada, uh, Chile, China, Congo. I mean, there's so many countries here because once again, it's the majority of the entire world. So I'm not going to read every single country, but it's noteworthy that there are even some U.S. allies on here that are telling the U.S. it needs to end this illegal criminal blockade of Cuba. So keep going, keep going. You know, even the United Kingdom is on here, you know, Britain. Um, but what it's more interesting to me, I mean, obviously we know why all these countries oppose the illegal U.S. blockade. But for me, I think what's more revealing is to look at the replies from different agencies and organs of the United Nations system. So if you go way down at the bottom of this very lengthy resolution, you can find that there are a series of statements from different UN organizations criticizing the illegal US blockade of Cuba. And these are, I think, are extremely revealing statements because it shows once again how criminal the US government is, how it's constantly violating international law. So let's look at this statement here from the United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. Again, this is a UN body. And it says, during the administration of President Donald Trump, over 240 coercive measures, that is sanctions, were activated against Cuba in the framework of the United States embargo against the island. And these still remain in force. In fact, on September 7th, 2021, the President of the United States, jo Joseph Biden, extended the law regulating the embargo against Cuba under the so-called Trading with the Enemy Act. And Biden has continued expanding that. And it says, in a memorandum addressed to the Secretary of State and the Secretary of the Treasury, the U.S. President ordered the extension of the sanctions that heavily limit trade with Cuba under these rules Former President Trump had renewed these in September 2020. So acknowledging, again, this is a UN committee, acknowledging that the Trump administration imposed at least 240 more sanctions, which are all illegal, and Biden has continued those sanctions. The UN committee says that the embargo imposes strict limitations on the Caribbean nation with extraterritorial effects that hinder its relation with third countries and affect the well-being of the, pop the Cuban population. Now, this is an important point because this is a UN body acknowledging that the U.S. blockade of Cuba doesn't just prevent Cuba from doing trade with the U.S. That's the propaganda we often hear from defenders of the illegal U.S. blockade. They say, well, the U.S. has the right to choose who it does business with, and it doesn't want to do business with communist Cuba. And why does communist Cuba want to do business with capitalist America, with the United States, the capitalist U.S.? Well, the reality is that the U.S. blockade in Cuba prevents Cuba from doing business with other countries and with companies from other countries because those other countries and those foreign companies are afraid of secondary sanctions. They're afraid of being hit by the U.S. sanctions so because Cuba is such a small economy and a small country of around 10 million, 10 million people, many of those countries don't want to risk access to the giant U.S. market of over 330 million people. So they just don't do business with Cuba. So the UN, this UN body is acknowledging here that the, UN, the, the illegal U.S. embargo, the blockade of Cuba, affects third countries as well. It also says that, that the U.S. sanctions deepen the multiple challenges imposed on Cuba by the coronavirus 
that's COVID-19 pandemic. And the sanctions multiply the pandemic's adverse socioeconomic health and financial effects. On several occasions, they have hindered the arrival of humanitarian aid in Cuba. And the U.S. government constantly lies, claiming that its sanctions, which are illegal, don't, they, have, they, they don't impede humanitarian aid. They have an exception for food and medicine and humanitarian aid. That's a lie. It's a blatant lie from the U.S. government. Now, if you keep going in this United Nations committee statement, it also says that the numerous U.S. sanctions produce real harm that obstruct the access of Cuban citizens to basic goods and violate their rights. These policies are an obstacle to economic, social, and environmental development. So that's a statement from a UN committee. And it says, in short, the numerous United States sanctions constitute the most severe and prolonged system of multilateral coercive measures ever applied against any country and continue to hinder, continue to hinder, hinder the development of the potential of the Cuban economy. That's a very important statement. Again, this is from a UN committee. I want to repeat this first half of it. U.S. sanctions against Cuba constitute the most severe and prolonged system of unilateral coercive measures ever applied against any country, any country in history. That is a UN committee saying that. Now, there are dozens of pages of these UN committees these UN bodies criticizing the US blockade. I'm not gonna go through every single one. I'll briefly summarize here. This is a statement from the UN Food and Agricultural Organization, the FAO. It talks about how the illegal US sanctions and blockade on Cuba prevent food production and make hunger worse and make it more difficult for Cuba to import food and develop its own domestic agriculture. It's a very lengthy statement. I'll just read here from the Food and Agricultural Organization. It says, Given that Cuba is subject to an embargo, projects implemented by FAO in the country are affected with regard to the procurement of equipment and supplies that complement the technical assistance because the resources that could be imported from the United States have to be imported from far more distant markets at much higher prices and higher freight costs. If acquisitions could be made in the United States, it would be much cheaper and more activities could be supported through the available budget. So here what they're saying is that the illegal U.S. blockade and sanctions on Cuba also prevent this U.N. body, the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization, from doing its own work. That is to say that the U.S. blockade also hurts the U.N. and its activities. And then it continues and it says, the most recent embargo measures against Cuba under which third country companies trading with Cuba can be sued in United States courts have had a negative impact on Cuban trade by drastically reducing the commercial partners that operate in the country. This has had a direct impact on the procurement operations that FAO carries out in Cuba in the framework of its technical cooperation projects. So once again, what that means is that the U.S. blockade in Cuba affects third countries and third country companies. That is to say, this is not just between the U.S. and Cuba. This is the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization acknowledging that the illegal U.S. blockade prevents foreign companies from trading with Cuba because those companies are afraid of being sued by the U.S. government. This is a full-on medieval-style blockade to prevent all countries in the world from doing trade with Cuba to try to make the Cuban people suffer, and as the U.S. State Department said, to bring about hunger, desperation, and overthrow of government, to bring about disenchantment, to bring about suffering and a decrease in wages. Now, let's continue here looking at this statement from the United Nations bodies. The FAO also acknowledges that the U.S. sanctions make it very difficult for Cuba to process payments and banking transactions. And again, because of the hegemony of the U.S. dollar and U.S. imperialism, most international trade is still denominated in the U.S. dollar. And the U.N. itself, these U.N. bodies, still use the U.S. dollar, which shows the bias of these international institutions and how the U.S. blockade is... is a global dictatorship. 
So there are more and more statements here. I'm just going to continue going on. Here is a statement, a very powerful statement from the International Labor Organization, which is also backed by the United Nations. This is a, a very powerful statement on the illegal U.S. blockade of Cuba. It says, the embargo, the embargo has intensified in recent years and has significantly constrained development possibilities in Cuba, greatly impacting the living conditions of the Cuban people. And as an example of the effects, it restricts transfers of remittances, which makes it harder for people to buy food, clothing, education, housing, water, sanitation. It limits commerce and financial transactions, so it makes it hard for Cuba to do business and trade. It limits access to technology transfer, so it blocks Cuba from getting access to new technologies. It also points out that the U.S. government's Helms-Burton Act intensifies the embargo by affecting business and investment opportunities in Cuba for third country investors, which prevents the creation of new job sources and decent work in Cuba. So once again, another UN body acknowledging this illegal US blockade also affects other countries, not just Cuba. I, I, I'm not gonna repeat myself more with that. I just wanted to stress that. And the, the International Labor Organization, backed by the UN, it says, the US embargo affects the Cuban economy and people and not only enterprises, but even more their workers and the population in general. The ILO is particularly concerned about the impacts on children, workers, and the elderly. So they say, especially in the con context of the coronavirus pandemic, the embargo is limiting the possibilities for the country to implement jobs and economic recovery strategies. So more and more statements, more and more statements. I'm just going to go through a few more highlights here because, again, this is a 177-page document, this resolution at the UN General Assembly. But no one ever reads these. I mean, just like a few journalists like me and maybe some diplomats, but that's why I wanted to go through it because you're not going to see this in mainstream corporate media. Now, here is a statement from the top human rights body of the United Nations, which is called, it's a mouthful, the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, the OHCHR. And this office says that it expressed concern regarding the negative impact that extraterritorial sanctions have on human rights. So acknowledging that these illegal U.S. sanctions violate human rights. The UN Human Rights Council expressed its grave concern that in some countries, like Cuba, these sanctions impede the full realization of social and economic development and hinder the well-being of the populations with particular consequences, consequences for women, children, the elderly, and persons with disabilities. So in diplomatic speak, diplomaties, you know, this, the, these UN bodies always speak very indirectly, right, with a lot of multisyllabic words. But what they're saying is that these illegal U.S. sanctions violate the human rights of the Cuban people, and especially they hurt women, children, and elderly, elderly people and people with disabilities. It also points out that United Nations human rights experts said they requested that the United States lift its economic and financial embargo on Cuba it is obstructing humanitarian responses to help the country's healthcare system fight the COVID pandemic. The UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights continues and says that because of these unilateral course of measures, that is illegal US sanctions, countries like Cuba were not able to obtain medical equipment vital to fight the pandemic, including oxygen supplies, ventilators, protective kits, and spare parts software. The United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights reiterated her call for lifting the unilateral sanctions given their negative impact on human rights, including Cubans' right to health. And the special procedure of the Human Rights Council stressed that unilateral sanctions impinge on the right to development and called on countries that impose unilateral sanctions to withdraw or at least minimize them to guarantee that the rule, the rule of law and human rights, including the right to development, are not affected. This is an important statement because we constantly hear the U.S. say the rules-based order, that the United States is supposedly defending the rules-based order in which Washington makes the rules and orders everyone around. Well, here is the top U.N. 
human rights body saying that the U.S. is violating the rule of law with these illegal sanctions. And because of these unilateral sanctions, countries like Cuba sink into poverty because they cannot get essential services like electricity, housing, water, gas, and fuel, yet alone medicine and food. So this is the UN acknowledging that these illegal U.S. sanctions create poverty and, and desperation. So, I mean, there's so many statements here. I'm almost done. There's stuff from UNICEF, the Children's Fund. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. The UN Development Program also condemned the illegal U.S. blockade, the United Nations Environment Program. I mean, there's so many here. The UN-backed World Food Program also condemned the illegal U.S. blockade and pointed out that over the past 60 years, despite the illegal blockade, Cuba's comprehensive social protection programs have largely eradicated hunger and poverty. Cuba was one of the most successful countries in achieving the Millennium Development Goals, and it's ranked 70th on the 2020 Human Development Index of the UN Development Program, despite the illegal sanctions and blockade. So, I mean, I'm not going to spend any more time on this. People get the point. This is completely criminal. The U.S. is violating every single tenet of international law or even its beloved rules-based order. This is the actual rules-based order. It's called the international law-based order with its center at the United Nations. And the United States, the U.S. empire, is the world's leading rogue regime that violates international law more than any other country on earth. And it's the Cuban people who suffer that criminal, illegal behavior. And that's why every single year, 95 or 96 percent of the countries on earth, the actual international community, vote to condemn this illegal U.S. blockade.